The instructions I've read and videos I've watched on vapor control are rubbish and I'll tell you why here. Put simply, the manufacturer's instructions are impossible to achieve and here for this project, trying to wrap the barrier up and down and over the old joists and somehow get it to stay on the old lath and plaster. And then at the eve, with the roof and nails sticking through and shards of timber, actually impossible without ripping and tearing. And even if you were able to magically fix it, this concept really only works for new build homes and things like garden rooms for warm roofs and rain screens where you install the vapour barrier as you build. And these new builds are done with breathable membranes that work in tandem with a vapour barrier. But the vast majority of existing housing stock doesn't have breathable membranes. Meanwhile, if you look at your friendly architect's drawings, which are, I suppose, just interpreting the regulations and standards, you'll see how the disconnect continues in the industry. The architect either doesn't care or doesn't know whether we can physically build what they are specifying when they are drawing impossible installations like these vapour barriers in existing building arrangements. It's a bit like wrapping up some crazy Blue Peter gift wrapping project. Let's talk about how you can design out the need for impossible vapour barrier airtight envelopes and make your insulation upgrades easier and less stressful. We'll talk about vapour control rather than vapour barrier and why I believe manipulating and directing the flow of your vapour is the realistic approach for our small home projects like house extensions to our old existing properties or an attic or loft conversion or maybe insulation upgrades for heat pump install. Now when you install some new insulation you immediately create a larger temperature difference between inside and outside and where there's a temperature difference, you get a new risk of condensation as the vapour which comes off our bodies and activities such as cooking and kettles circulates through the air and transfers through the building envelope. Eventually this invisible vapour will come into contact with the cold air sitting within and around the building envelope as it gradually passes through the insulation. And when warm vapour meets cold air, that vapour condenses, called the dew point, and we get a build-up of moisture. Now, interstitial condensation is the name we give this slow-creeping moisture build-up. And it's especially awful because we can never see it occurring until it's too late. By then, it's probably morphed into rot or you're smelling damp from mould that's formed and it's all concealed within the timbers. The job of the vapour barrier is supposedly to prevent that invisible vapour migrating through the insulation and instead direct it to the outside in a controlled manner, for example, through things like permaventilators in your windows, through extract ducts. And so we arrive at the challenge of creating an airtight envelope from a continuous and unbroken polythene vapour barrier for your home project. House in a bag, so to speak. Here's where the problems start in the real world. Problem number one, room needs sockets. They need lights, radiators that need pipes. Take a look at something like a kitchen or an ensuite bathroom in an attic and you'll see loads of penetrations in a vapour high area, extracts, ducts, holes, recess lighting, and all these things penetrate the envelope, great paths for the vapour to escape. And how do we properly tape and seal around all our sockets, pipes and junctions? Very difficult to do it consistently. Problem number two, even if you were magically able to get the polythene vapour barrier to work perfectly, it's pretty much impossible to get a continuous insulation envelope around it in an old building due to joists or rafters being in the way. So you're always going to get areas of cold bridging. Problem number three, most older properties are rainproofed with some form of felt. 
Now it might be different in different areas of the country, but from around my part, traditional roofing felt used in almost all existing housing is not breathable in the way it needs to be and for this attic conversion the only way to add a breathable membrane on the cold side of the insulation was to strip off all the roof and just not feasible for your average family renovation project problem number four take a look at any eaves and you'll see an uneven arrangement of timbers that will easily tear polythene and hard to access areas that no amount of taping and stapling will sort it is literally impossible to get your hands in. The reality of running building projects, whether using tradesmen or just doing it yourself, the level of quality control is so precise, I think we're just being set up to fail for concepts which are pretty much impossible in practice for the rest of us idiots on a time and budget constraint. The testing of these vapour barriers, which in turn forms the standards, is carried out using laboratory built, perfectly constructed new build conditions and that is useless for people like me and the projects that I do. If you're an architect or specifier, please let me know once you've watched what I've got to say where I'm off point, but for me here on this channel we do need to always provide solutions. So what's to be done? How do I do it? Before explaining, I'll start by saying that despite my suspicions about the usefulness or otherwise of a vapour barrier, I'll include it on the basis that every little helps and also because without it, I won't pass building regulations. There are two ways I will mitigate for my compromised vapour barrier that won't prevent water vapour getting through. First is designing out problems before they occur. Let's give you some examples. I always avoid spotlights in cold roofs and I would never reduce the insulation to fit them in. There's a host of alternatives that you can do which are much better. So instead of a spotlight here, I would use an uplighter instead. Same here at the stairwell. And I actually think that uplighters provide a better quality of light anyway. And you can do this even in garden rooms where the, where the ceiling level is very low and the light just creates a pleasant wash on the ceiling. For this house extension, rather than cutting into the insulated plasterboard and breaking the foil membrane for lighting and cabling, I'll just leave good alone and use up layers again. Rather than have my plugs breaking through the membrane here, I'll aim to create a false wall with the insulation step back from the plasterboard. Rather than put my insulation between the studs, with all that additional jointing and then using insulated plasterboard and then penetrating where things like sockets and cables occur, Instead, I'll step the insulation back, which allows me to have an unbroken run of insulation where I only need to tape the junctions at the boards and I avoid all penetrations since I've created a services zone on the warm side of the insulation. And wherever and whenever I can for my walls and for my roofs, I'll eliminate all cold bridges by designing warm roofs and walls. And here for this dormer arrangement, I've made the dormers take up as much of the roof area up as possible. And because these dormers are effectively new build, I can have a warm roof with this lovely fleece back, single ply membrane bonded directly to the insulation, which sits on top of the roof deck. And that means I can puncture the ceiling with all manner of things until my heart's content since the vapour barrier is higher up and I've eliminated all the cold bridging risk you get in other types of roof. See my other video here for more on the difference between warm roof, cold roof and hybrid roofs, which one you should use and where. Okay, designing out is all well and good, but sometimes that's not going to help me. So my second big thing to help me stop worrying about whether my sketchy vapour barrier is going to let condensation kill my roof. Second is another V word, and it's a beautiful word in the builder's arsenal of jargon. It's called ventilation. If you get your ventilation right, if you understand the principles and incorporate them, you can stop worrying about the effectiveness 
of a vapor barrier. Back to another attic conversion. I said before, now I'll never get a vapor barrier up and over these joists at the same time as getting it right into the eaves. And with, I think it was 300 millimeters of mineral wool insulation in this space to keep the downstairs rooms warm. There's a big condensation risk as the warm, moist air reaches the cold air within this void since there's no breather membrane on the outside of the building. By introducing roof vents at strategic points, we create a rapid air movement in a cold space and this movement means condensation is not able to form. I ventilate all my voids, regardless of whether a small cavity above the insulation here on this house extension, right through to these big voids in attics. And when you put your hands inside these voids, you can feel the air movement rushing over uh, because what we do is we create a negative pressure situation where we put more vents at the eaves and fewer at the ridge which means that the air is being literally sucked through the building because of that speed of air movement you will get rapid evaporation and collection of any air vapor before it condenses and i'll use these two strategies in my fabric design together with a vapor barrier and foil tape for a bit of extra help. But as insulation requirements become more and more stringent in the building regulations, good insulation design working with good ventilation design are what will win the vapor condensation war as the temperature differences get more and more. If you enjoyed this video, please hit me a like, it really helps me, and I'll see you next time.